welcome to the party here on this fine Tuesday morning. Let's see what we got here. Let me adjust my green screen. The problem with the green screen is that you have a trade-off. I can do this and be invisible, or I can do this and have a green screen. But there's a sweet spot in the middle where I'm neither. Okay, I think that's pretty good. Um, okay, we're going to dark mode. That's all the rage now. Uh, so for the the notes, I don't know. We'll see how this goes. We can like uh, we don't we don't want that. Okay, we need a white cursor. Let's see how that looks. We've got an integral there, so we can we can do that. That's a thing. Um, yeah, let's see how it goes. Anyone got a problem with that? Uh, swapping the colors. I don't know if that's I mean white white and black or most people can see those colors. Um, I think we're good there. Uh, okay, well yeah, we'll, we'll, if, if you go back and realize that it's annoying for some reason, just let me know, we'll, we'll go back to the standard whiteboard. But I figure <clears throat> next year we're gonna have to use a whiteboard, so we may as well enjoy his freedom to choose our color scheme. Um, all right, so we're here. Uh, for those of you that are not in Pittsburgh, we've uh, got a beautiful blanket of snow here. Um, thankfully, at least I don't have to go outside at all to teach, um, so I can just sit inside and, and observe it and enjoy it. Um, I see Juwen is, uh, you got a little more tropical theme going on there, I like that. It's a pretty pretty nice setup. I'm interpreting that as real. I interpret all backgrounds as yeah. real. Uh, so Vincent is overlooking the Golden Gate there. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see, anything else? Um, the homework. I assume you guys handed in the homework. I haven't checked formally in Canvas, so you know you could. Well, actually, no. I can see when you hand it in. So if you were to hand it in late, uh, I would know. Not that I would necessarily care that much, but I would know. Um, that you know, when you have the physical hand in, you know, it's like you can. It's it's not it's not tracked when you hand it in. So like it's like uh, if I tell you hand it into my office at midnight, assuming I'm not in my office at midnight, you can hand it in any time. Uh, until presumably I get in, which is usually around 2 p.m. So, um, yeah. And then sometimes you got people sitting outside the place where it's due, like working on it until the person comes to pick it up. Uh, yeah. That's always that's always fun. Although you do get seen, but still technically, you know, there's no delay in getting it to the to the grader. Um, okay, so I'll try and grade those quickly. Uh, solution. I, I have the solutions. I need to like collate them into a proper document and post them on the website. Um, so I will do that, uh, and then I guess um, maybe. Well, I, I kind of want to jump into lecture today. Maybe we can. I mean, if you have questions about, or, you know, retrospective questions about the homework, happy to talk about the, you know, at office hours or, or whenever, basically, um, including now uh, or, or next time. So, um, yeah. But if if we're happy with the homework, then we could just you know keep on going. All right. Seems like you guys are. are not unhappy with the homework, so that's good enough. Um, all right, so we're gonna we're gonna move on from solo today. Uh, kind of leave him in the dust um, and and go into to the world of Ramsey. All right, so uh, that should be fun. Um, let me let's see where my slides at. These are not slides. Uh, hold on. Uh, just to confirm, are we recording? We are recording. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for the the uh, check there. I'm it, I'm si simultaneously getting better, but it, you know keep keep on asking. So, uh, but uh, just just in case, okay. Um, let's see. All right. Um, we have notes. I need to maximize this. So it's all good. All right, there we are. So um, we're we're gonna jump into to Ramsey and actually. Let's go back for one minute um, to solo. Okay, so we basically, you know, b between, uh, you know, last time we basically finished up that stability stuff. Okay. Um, 
you know, where were we? Uh, yeah, we we were uh, looking at you know stability stuff and sort of the the, the punchline last time, which you know I've always found kind of interesting is is if you if you plot right so you have this dynamical system I guess we can call it that where the rate of change of x is just some function g of x so it's just like a totally general one d dynamical system uh, and that g of x function you know that's okay so yeah I gotta go back to the black cursor for a second so that's that g of x function right uh, which is you know which is like x dot and um, here and this is x okay so you can just plot that and that'll basically tell you everything about your system okay and in, in particular what what determines stability is just the direction that you cross right so that if you, if you go low it pushes you back up and vice versa that's characteristic of um, where am I at here that's characteristic of this kind of thing here which point of things that's characteristic of, of this sort of middle point here and like anything in between these lines is going to converge there and then anything uh, the other thing the other direction is unstable okay anything outside of those bounds is gonna diverge okay um so yeah so that i mean and graphically that's pretty much it and if you want to check that for a particular model okay you know not just graphically but algebraically okay then you can do that, okay, um, and you just need to figure out what it, you figure out, evaluate g prime, that derivative, which is just the direction, right, uh, uh, of the function as it crosses zero at the particular steady state that you're interested in, okay. Um, and so let's, I think, yeah, so the next here, I mean, I'm not going to go through it, um, but I, actually, you, you did this in the homework, right? I believe you would have done yeah. this sort of thing. You did it, right? Okay, so you can evaluate it, and you get a number. And in the case of uh, standard Cobb-Douglas solo model, you get an unambiguous negative sign. Okay, which is always good. Um, it's it's always stable, essentially because of that concavity of that investment function versus the linearity of the depreciation function. Okay, um, of course, if you had uh, a different production function that was potentially not concave, at least. For a, for a time, you, you could kind of go up above it and then back down below it. Okay, so you could cook up a non-concave production function to, to to get you that. And like, actually, I think it's it's interesting enough to write down. Um, so you could, um, you know, if you had my forehead is transparent, um, we're just gonna have to live with that. Uh, so if you had a situation where, let's see. Um, you have some depreciation line, okay. I guess what we're saying is you'd, you'd have a, a production function which is sort of decreasing returns initially and then maybe increasing and then decreasing eventually, okay, right, which is a little goofy. I guess the, the alternative would be, perhaps that this is less convoluted, would be initially increasing returns. Oh no, how do I undo things? That's that's a skill I haven't mastered yet, so we're just going to redraw it. Okay, so um, you could have increasing returns initially and then decreasing. Like, that that makes a little bit more sense. Okay, kind of went off the rails there at the end. Okay, and then this just sort of does whatever it does. Okay, it should be increasing at least. But so now you have these two intersection points. Okay, and and remember this is this is depreciation and this is investment here. Right, so this would be um, I don't know. You could you could cook up that investment curve by combining uh, like convolving like a sort of sigmoid function with a normal decreasing returns function. So that it's like <clears throat> initially it's like well we we're, we have this factory and we basically have no idea what we're doing, so things aren't going well. But the, as we scale it up, we kind of learn. But then eventually, if we get too big, you know, we start running into resource constraints or something, and, and so that you know presumably eventually decreasing returns kicks in okay that's probably going to be true otherwise everything is, is is off the table but you might have some initial like learning what the hell you're doing kind of phase and, and and that's why you might get this initially increasing returns and then decreasing okay so uh if you have that right you can see from this split type graph um that uh you know you, you're basically 
so this this isn't g right the g is the difference between these two in this particular case right so here it's if, if you just rotate your head uh g is negative and then positive and negative but essentially um at this point if you go a little higher investment you're, you're kind of learning what you're doing investment's going to outpace depreciation and then you'll eventually end up at this point so this this guy here is stable okay what is the the lag on my ipad is like incredible i don't know why that is are you guys seeing that um, it's kind of hard to tell whether we're lagging yeah because you guys don't know when i'm yeah there's a lag so it's it's more than let me think why would that be let me try and just like unpair it and then repair it because it's usually there's some lag but it's like you know less than a second here it's like five seconds which is weird because this is not i mean it's just connected on my local wi-fi or whatever okay let's let's see lag when i said the word lag i wrote that on the right side and it's Ah, okay, so there, hold on, this will only take a second, I'm just going to restart everything. Mm. Regarding my iPad. Come on, iPad, you can do this. I blame Apple, they're a monopoly, they're not a monopoly, but they act like a monopoly sometimes, and they, they're not very, they're not very friendly, they have this walled garden sort of thing. Um, okay, let's, okay, I wrote X2. Okay, that's faster. Okay, that's good enough for, for this situation. Okay, that was, that's slower. Well, we're going to have to live with it, okay? Um, yeah, it's just like not... Updating. Hold on. Let me try one more test here, and then we're gonna live with it. Okay. All right. Well, it's back. Okay. So it's gonna vary, but you know what can you do? Um, okay. So let's focus here. I'm talking to myself. Um, this is gonna be the stable one. This is gonna be unstable. So you're, if you if you end up around this point, you're just gonna scale up uh, until you get to that stable point. Okay. And so they, there's only two, and so they they do alternate. Um, because there's one or the other. Uh, in this case, where you have sort of like this weird triple intersection, right? So you're gonna have three steady states, okay? Um, this one is gonna be, the low one is gonna be stable. Oops. Um, the low one is gonna be stable. Okay, and then this one is gonna be unstable. Okay, and then this one is gonna be, I'll just write S for stable. Okay, the top one is gonna to be stable as well. So you're gonna have two uh, stable steady states and one unstable, and they're gonna alternate again because it's just a matter, a matter of continuity, basically. Okay, so um, yeah, so that, that and, and if you wanna, so like, you know, if you wanna map this into like the proper, you know, G of X setting, then it would just look like, um, you know, it would look like this where, it's just sort of, in this case, it just looks a lot like rotating at 40, whatever degrees, depreciation degrees to the right uh, clockwise. Um, but, you know, it's just the difference between those those two curves. Okay, so that would be a proper x dot or k dot or whatever uh, exposition. Okay. Um, all right, and so you can use a, graphically, you can do that for, for anything you want to. Okay. Um, all right, and then uh, I think that's it. Okay, so let's pop back to solo here. Um, that's pretty much it. You can there, now. There's also with regards to stability. There's the question of there's, well, there's global and local stability. Okay, which which I've actually you know kind of been talking about both a little bit. So the local stability is really just looking at if you're at a point when I bump you a little bit off of the point, do you return? Okay, locally. Okay, uh, global stability is if I take you and drop you anywhere in the space, do you return to that particular steady state? Okay, so. Now, with you, you know, if, if they're just one steady state, okay, um, as long as you don't, I guess, die, well, this, this can get complicated. Let's just say in the solo case, you know, as we saw 
just a second ago. Okay, so in the in the basic solo case, right? So the basic original solo case that we had was like, you know, just one intersection. This is a bad graph, but you know, just one intersection here, and that's it. Okay, um, which is to say, you know, in um, if you look at the difference, right, it's going to be something like, uh, you know, this. Okay, so just very simple game, one intersection with zero, and it's stable. Okay, and then you can see globally, you know, if I drop you anywhere in that space, even if I drop you, you know, way up, way up high, you're going to converge back, and, and the same for low. Um, there's an exception at zero. Okay, if you start at zero, you stay at zero. So, you know. Technically, if you if you insist on including zero in your, your possible points that could put you, then it's not globally stable. But as long as you exclude that, let's say it's globally stable. Okay, for any practical purposes. All right. Um, I guess you could do it. You could make a generic. You, generically, if I drop you somewhere, uh, you'll end up back at that steady state because the zero point is measure zero. Okay, so um, you guys did generically in like kind of kind of metrics and theory and all that. Is that is that a word that means things to you? Somewhat. I mean, in the context that you said it, yeah, but I don't think we've ever used it in any formal mathematical sense. Oh, I see. Okay. So, yeah, I wonder. I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe. I guess it doesn't have to show up in a kind of metrics. Yeah, depending on how you teach it. But I mean, all it means is like, if you say something is generically true, it's like in a continuous, say, real space. It's 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 true for basically almost every point in the sense of uh, where it's not true is measure zero. Okay, so just like a little, ad if you just have a little you know, single ad atomic points in a continuous real space where this thing doesn't hold, then it's generically, it's still true. If you just threw a dart randomly, it would be true at whatever point that dart hit. Okay, so that's sort of what we're talking when, when I say generically, okay? Um, and we definitely have danced around the topic without using the word yep. on okay, multiple occasions. I see. I see, all right, yep. So I mean I'm 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 using it loosely. I'm not going to do any proofs with it, but yeah, it's just sort of you know it's a, it's a term that you'll see out there. Um, okay, so yeah, so that's global stability. It's just if I if you you know it, you, you always end up there regardless of where you you start. Okay, and now you can see in these cases. Okay, um, uh, let's see. So so this is that case where you know it like in this case the 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 dividing point is uh, here, okay, at that unstable one. And so anywhere over here, you're gonna end up, on the left side, you're gonna end up at the low steady state and the high side, you're gonna end up at the high steady state, okay? Um, and then, so here, remember this one is unstable and this one is stable, okay? And so in this case, and I guess there is, there's an, let me th oh, so this is, yeah, so this, this is, it's, it's interesting. So this one's actually, though the zero point now is stable Okay, because if you're below that like minimum efficient scale, I guess you could call it, you're gonna have high depreciation and, and you basically kind of don't know what you're doing and so you're not producing that much, you're investing that much, and so you're actually gonna sink down to that low steady state. Okay, so here, remember the dividing, like the continental divide, if you wanna call it that, is at the unstable point and then you're either gonna go up or down depending on which side you're on, okay? I'm saying continental divide because if you think about Maybe you know this. Maybe you don't. If you think about how rivers flow, right? Um, one side of the mountain it flows west, and the other side it flows east. That that ridge on the mountain is unstable because you're going to fall off it, uh, and that's the the dividing line. Okay. Um, so this is like one river. This is the other river. Okay. Uh, all right. And then and you can even have saddle points. So if you want to think about things topographically, sometimes that's useful. Um, so. Here you're going to have that situation where you know you have this dividing line. So is it you know are these points globally stable? No, because if I put you on one side of the mountain, you're not going to end up on the other side of the mountain. Okay, uh, they're like kind of stable. I mean they're, they're yeah. I mean they're pretty good. You know there, there's an extent. You know if, if I only move you five feet, as long as you're sufficiently far away from that dividing line, you'll be fine. Okay, so they're they're, they're more than locally, but they're not globally. They're somewhere in between. Um, yeah, and then okay, so now this is one D. When you get in when you get into two D, things sometimes get a little bit more tricky because in one D, uh, as if you have continuous movements in one D, it's actually rather hard to oscillate. I think it's impossible actually, because um, 
you, if you don't jump, right? If, if, you, if you look at these, if, if you're not jumping around, you're moving just infinitesimally all the time. If you if this thing is the stay state is stable, you're not gonna like overshoot it and then go back. I mean, you're just gonna go there and stay there, right? And if it's unstable, you're gonna move away from it. So you actually can't get these oscillatory dynamics in one D, uh, but in two D you can. You can orbit around a point, for instance. Okay, so if you're in a two dimensional space. Uh, you could think about like a drain. You open a drain with water and you sort of spiral into it. Okay, so that's something where it's like you're you're kind of orbiting, but you're also converging. Okay, but you could also just purely orbit and not spiral in. Okay, um, and that would be, you know, th there the notion of steady state is more complicated because that, that's a sort of steady state. Okay, it's you're, you're going to stick in in that orbit forever. Uh, it's not a point, but it's a path. Okay, so so there is there are you know complications that arise when you go into higher dimensions. Okay, and if you want to think about it in a, a sort of a physics analogy, okay, in one D you don't have any, which which also applies in econ. Uh, in one D you don't have any notion of momentum. Okay, you're not like a spring where you 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 oscillate back and forth and you're trading off momentum for position. Okay, you just sort of like boom and you converge. Okay, but in when you add in momentum, which is that second dimension then you can get, you know, oscillatory dynamics. Okay, so that's that's sort of the how it works. And so many times, I mean, in econ, we, we often don't have a concept of momentum, right? You know, if you think about, you know, you think about the these day traders out there buying GameStop and all sorts of cryptocurrencies, they're talking, oh, we got this got momentum, we're, we're riding this wave. You know, that's not really consistent with the rational expectations, you know, uh, things like that. So because you would price that in and so on. Okay, but not to say it can't happen, but it's like a lot of the time, sort of forward-looking rational expectations precludes uh, momentum and, and actually ensures something like stability and convergence. Okay, so, you know, again, it, it can happen in the real world, of course, but but the assumptions that we often make preclude it, and so it's something to be aware of. Okay, um, all right, so that's dynamical system. This is cool stuff. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll be implicitly using it. Uh, maybe not so much the... the sort of chaotic oscillatory you know high dimensional stuff but uh we'll be we'll be using it here and there okay we'll, we'll even we'll go into higher dimensions okay but it yeah maybe we'll talk about oscillations but that that'll be later on okay so but let's um yeah so that's that's stability that's some long range on stability um and i guess yeah and then i don't know this you but you did this too in the homework so there's a special case cobb douglas solving it um and uh, yeah, you can do other stuff. You can do Brownian motion. Okay, that's where that's where instead of moving deterministically, you move stochastically, but in continuous sense. Okay, and it seems pretty simple. I mean, you just have a random variable bouncing you around. Uh, but it turns out when you go to a continuous stochastic process, things get a little wacky sometimes, and you need to be careful. Um, and also valuing those processes saying like how much do i value a process that's oscillating according to this this uh rule uh stochastically is complicated it's doable um but you need to be careful how you do things okay um all right and so hey did anyone did anyone get a closed form solution for that ces got any contour integrators out there i haven't personally i or if i did i've forgotten um, and it might be impossible. I'm just wondering. I keep. I, I think I've done this like multiple years. It's like, is this my my method of proving is assign it to a homework? And if no one gets it, then it must be false. Um, yeah. So it's probabilistically it's false. Okay. Um, right. Uh, or like it's 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 false enough for me. Okay. Let's let's, let's say that. Um, now I mean it, it. The path exists. It's just a matter of is there a closed form. So. Uh, okay. So. That's great. Um, that's that's so. Any any final um, concerns or questions regarding Solo before we move on to to Ramsey? Okay, I think we've seen enough of that guy. Uh, let's let's move on. Okay, so we're gonna go home and then we're gonna open up Ramsey. So this is uh, chapter three. Okay, so uh, yeah, so Ramsey. I'm gonna call it the Ramsey model. It's, it's got many names. In fact, I go over some of the names right in the next few slides here. Uh, but but the Ramsey model really what we're just doing is endogenizing the savings rate. Okay, and so you got I mean you guys did the neoclassical growth model in with with Danny. So again I'm part of this is just bringing that into I mean this is basically just bringing that in continuous time. Okay, um, 
I think, yeah, I mean, and then we're changing the name for some reason to to, to Ramsey, okay? Um, so so I I'm, I'm, I won't belabor some stuff, and, and I actually, I'm gonna streamline it this year a little bit, okay? Compared to what I did last year, I think I think it'll help. Um, but we, 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 what you really want to do focus on is is the continuous time optimization techniques, okay? Because those are pretty powerful and they're pretty general, okay? The way that we're gonna talk about them. So if you think about, uh, you know, you had with with Danny, you probably did sequential kind of t t plus one equilibria, and then you did the recursive formulation with value functions v of k, right? Um, so that all those value function theorems and such, uh, you know, like the envelope condition or all that stuff. Um, that's, it, it's kind of what we're doing. It, it, that has analogs here, okay? We're gonna do it a little bit more akin to sequential style at first, where it's like we're thinking about a time path rather than a path or rather than working like in a recursive state space. But you can you can do both and we'll do both eventually, okay? Um, yeah, and so so we need to endogenize the savings rate, and therefore we need to have people making decisions about how much to save and, and consume. All right. Um, yeah, we can go to the other stuff later. Um, and we're you know we're gonna do representative agent, single representative agent for now. Nothing saying you can't do stuff different from that. And in fact, when you want to do a heterogeneous agent stuff, it's often easier to think about it in continuous time for various reasons, some of which is computational. Um, in horizon decentralized the whole thing okay um all right so this so wait i call it, i'm gonna call it the ramsey model but like sometimes people call it the ramsey cats kubins model i don't know i figure what the, i think that's what it's called in wikipedia though i can't remember um and it's just like there were various people out there uh thinking about this and like it wasn't really clear it was first and it didn't really get nasty or anything like that they just kind of decided on putting three names up there okay so you got Frank Plumpton Ramsey. Okay, so that's R.V. Plumpton namesake right there. Frank Plumpton Ramsey. Uh, sadly died at 27, uh, pretty young, but like did a ton of stuff like and not just econ, but philosophy and and, and uh, like moral philosophy things like that. So pretty pretty incredible figure actually. Um, then you got Kellen Koopmans. Not sure what what's up with him, but he's out there. Uh, you got Dave Cass, Journal of the Army. He was he was my micro professor. In baseball, he, he in two thousand eight, he like died right after right after our class. So, but he he was possibly a flawed individual, but a uh, pretty good teacher. Um, and and he, he he had a sort of martial style to teaching. He would send us emails from the general of the army and things like that. So, um, and his TA was like his deputy or something. So, you know, it kept things lively at least. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, so that, those are names you can associate with this, but I'm just going to say Ramsey for you know brevity's sake. Um, all right, so uh, we're we're in continuous time, okay? Right, so that's uh, that's the big change, all right? And um, I'm, first, I need to tell you kind of some stuff about how it all works, okay? Um, in particular, with regards to like discounting, okay? Um, how to you know how to think about discounting, how to think about it as a continuous limit of of a successively smaller and smaller slices of discrete time, okay? Uh, and so, um, I'm gonna prop, well, I'll switch over to the, to the um, sort of blackboard now uh, and, and write out some stuff. So, but, but essentially, um, one thing is like, you know, sort of why do we have this exponential style discounting and so on, okay? But if you, if you look at here, you know, think about, um, our uh, objective function here, okay, so u of zero. So we're thinking about from the perspective of time zero, if you have some utility function, how I mean, how do you how are you gonna write it in continuous time? So in, in discrete time, it's just the sum. In continuous time, it's this integral. Uh, and we're just gonna exponentially discount, okay? And then the, the only thing, you know, you've probably seen, you know, we've seen stuff like this before, very, probably in various contexts. So we're gonna discount e to the minus rho t. Rho is our discount rate. That's a positive number. And again, as with, um, so with depreciation, for instance, you know, it's, it's a positive number, but it's not less than one, okay? Whereas in uh, discrete time, beta, usually they call it, is between zero and one. Rho is the same, it's a discount rate, but it's, it's uh, you know, it's just some positive number. It could be infinite or nearly infinite, right? Um, if you want to think about what's your discount rate over a yearly horizon, well, then that's e to the minus rho if you're measuring rho in years, which is less than one. And so that all works, that's fine. Uh, but it's like, it depends on your time horizon, okay? 
All right, so here I have this utility function. We want to be clear about how we're evaluating utility. Okay, so remember we have this represent what what is often called the representative agent um, framework. Okay, but but also it's often called the representative household framework. Okay, because uh, you, you basically you want to have population growth. Okay, but you only want to have one decision maker. And so how do you do that? I mean, you you can't have a dictator. This is economics. Uh, so you have a household with somehow makes decisions collectively and everyone agrees on the decisions. So there's no political problems. Uh, and that's how things work. So it's, it's a sort of a rinky dink construction to, to make things simple. Okay. And so that, but the household utility would be, you know, whatever your consumption is at time T, throw that in the utility function, discount it. And also you need to, you know, how many people are there? Okay. So this, this is implicitly saying we're valuing people, uh, equally within a given time period, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so it's like utilitarian within a time period, I guess. Uh, and and but then we also are discounting, all right. So there's the question of like you know how do you how do you value um, people that come in the future, okay? That's like a, a sort of a moral philosophy question. Um, and so this one is saying there are more people in the future, so they get like more weight, right? I mean, in, in equal proportion to their numbers. Uh, but we are discounting their utility in the future, okay? So. That's kind of how it works. We have people being basically, we're not taking a stance on like who's like, is like is it people being born and dying or is it just no one ever dies and, and people are being born? It kind of doesn't matter the way we're doing this, but L is growing basically. That population is growing and that's, and it's just going in linearly, okay? But the other thing is, which is just a, a byproduct basically of continuous time is that, you know, if L is growing exponentially at rates N, then it's just going to look like this. So I'll up here e to the uh, nt, assuming it starts at value one. And if you plug that in here, like you can kind of you have a double negative turning into a positive, but you can you can combine that into one effective discount rate, okay? Which is rho minus n. Okay, so that means that we, but then the minus is outside here. So so the effective discount rate is saying we have we are discounting at rho, but there's more people in the future. So like if there's more population growth then we kind of want to weight the future a little bit more relatively, okay? So hopefully rho minus n is still positive, okay? Otherwise things go mathematically a little haywire, right? So, but but this is going to be our our effective discount rate taking into account pure rate of time discount, uh, time preference and population growth, okay? So let, you know, if rho is, you know, 4% and then population growth is 2%, then this net discount rate is going to be 2%, okay? So it's just, it's just, reflecting the fact that there's more people in the future, okay? So we're going to assume that rho is greater than n in this case, because, because otherwise it doesn't, <clears throat> your utility is not well defined. So if you, know, if, you if, if rho is greater than, um, or sorry, rho is less than n, this would be a positive term here. And let's say that consumption was just constant, right? With the constant utility, then this integral would be unbounded, okay? Uh, it would be infinite and it's, it's, you don't really know what to, to say about that, okay? Uh, all right, so but that that's a pretty usual and I, I think fairly safe assumption to make. Okay, um, all right, so cool, that's good. Um, and then we have this discounting business. Okay, um, you know why why do we exactly do either the minus rho t and how does that come from uh, a discrete time analog? Okay, so so what you can do is um, let me pop over to the iPad here. Uh, you can think about um, so so think I'm gonna I'm gonna write it as this v function okay so um, let's see so first discounting okay I'm gonna write it as this v function so this is saying how much do you value one unit uh, of this good in it in t periods ahead or at time t okay and I'm also gonna condition it on delta um, because uh, where we're gonna do this at different time steps. Okay, so implicitly in the background here, you know, we have this, you know, time starting from point zero, and then there's t, and then we're just breaking this up into equal size to delta uh, breaks. Okay, and there's like, there's okay, so there's n of them. Okay, uh, and so you know, delta times n should be equal to t. Okay, that's just like, you know, accounting, right? So we're going to split it up evenly <clears throat> and decides delta chunks and then there should be 
I mean, there should like there's going to be some like remainder, but there's going to be about this is going to be approximately true that that delta times n is is equal to t. Okay. Uh, okay. So then, how how do we do this? How do we value something t periods ahead if we have um, a, a rate of time discount uh, rho? Okay. So we're still going to have rho some rho positive. Okay. Um, and basically, what we're going to say is, okay, well, if we think about this as, um, you know, this n delta size uh, uh, periods, okay, so the way you can do it is essentially, okay, you're going to, each delta period, you're going to discount by 1 minus delta rho, okay? So, so each time uh, you move one delta step ahead, you're going to add on this factor of 1 minus delta rho. Okay, so this this would be like one minus beta. Okay, but we're we're mapping beta into delta times rho. Okay, because rho rho is like a per unit time. That's like the the uh, units of it. Um, and so to get like an actual discount rate, you need to give it. You need to multiply some time period by it. Okay, so we're gonna have one minus delta rho, and then we have n of those. Okay, so that'd be like to the n. Okay, which is which is also going to equal one minus delta rho to the t over delta. Okay, just plugging in for you know and and so we have this equation here is is t over delta. Okay, so you you have that discount rate inside and you're applying it um, n times, which is t over delta. Okay, so here we have that situation which may be familiar where you have something that's getting increasingly as delta goes to zero. Okay, you have something that's getting closer to one, but then it's getting uh, sort of multiplied by itself many times. Okay, and this is this should look like something like the definition of the exponential function, like the limit. Th th that's kind of how you can construct. A, this, it's one characterization of the exponential function is that is that limit of these two opposing forces. Okay, so um, yeah, and so you can. Uh, yeah, so you, you can, if you want to, you know, if you want to take this limit, okay, you can do it. I mean, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know, maybe you've seen this before, maybe you haven't, but if, if you want to evaluate this kind of limit, okay, so the one trick that uh, people often use is, okay, so we're looking for the limit of this thing as delta goes to zero, okay? Um, and so essentially we're going to, we're going to, okay, let me, First of all, okay, so we want the limit. Let me, let me, let me. We're looking for the limit. Uh, what did I write? Okay, so we're for the limb. This delta goes to zero, okay, of one minus delta rho t over delta. Okay, so the, the trick here you can do is, uh, it's gonna involve a little bit rule, but um, also you can do, uh, sort of exponentiation and logarithmizing uh, okay so you can just nest those okay so that's just sort of true okay exponential and log are, are inverses of one another uh, then you can you want to move that limit inside so ex exponent and log are both continuous functions you can move the limit in, inside both of those okay um, in this case, we're, we're just gonna move it inside one, basically. Uh, so we're gonna move it inside there and say that this is the limit of this thing as delta goes to zero, the log of, yes, I wanna be clear about, I, I need to use two parentheses here. That, so that log, and then that's the exponential, okay? Let's move this up. All right, and then here's where we're gonna use L'Hopital's rule, okay? Well, not quite. Um, and then we also need to use the, the definition of the logarithm, delta goes to zero, uh, to bring down that t over delta, okay? But we're gonna write it like this so that it'll be amenable to L'Hopitalization, okay? So we're gonna, you bring down that that um, t, t over delta, but we're going to put it in the denominator and flip it so that it's delta over t. But it's it's t over delta, okay. But now we have 
top and bottom, we have things, the top's going to minus infinity. Um, sorry. The, sorry, the top's going to zero. As delta goes to zero, that's a log of one that goes to zero. The bottom goes to zero. Okay, that's L'Hopital. Right. L'Hopital. The hospital. Um, and we can do that, and then we'll be all set, right? There's no S. Just, you know, there's no, no S in there. Remember that. Um, okay, so... What's that going to give us? So it's going to be the, we still have the limit, but then we're going to take a derivative. Okay, so what do we get? We're going to get minus, because this is going to get a little goofy, but we're going to get like a minus rho over one minus delta rho on top. Okay. And on the bottom, we're going to get one over t. Okay, so it's getting a little ungainly there, but that's, that's what we'll have. Uh, and so that's, okay, and then when, when you take the limit, the, the one minus delta rho thing is just going to turn into a one. The one over one over t is just a t. So, it, you know, everything kind of collapses into minus rho times t. Okay? So you get minus rho times t. All right, you just have to use exponent log trick, L'Hopital, move at a limit through a continuous function. So that's that's sort of how things work there. Um, I guess, um, yeah, so... so I don't know. It's 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 an interesting proof technique, it, and it's it, it's oftentimes if you want to prove stuff in continuous time, as as these continuous limits. I mean, you you might need to use tricks like that. Okay, so that's that's sort of like founding the the type of discounting. So then we can go back and say, okay, well that utility function we wrote makes sense. Okay, um, as a limit of a of a discrete uh, process. Okay. All right, so. Now we need to, to think about that. That's more mathematical. Okay, so now we need to kind of think about, okay, how are we going to do this, operationalize this um, this uh, sort of endogenization of, of the savings rate, okay? So, um, yeah, so we need, uh, we, we have utility, okay? We, you, know, you have some, let me just start a new page here. Uh, okay, so this is again, Ramsey. Okay, so we have some consumption, right? That mapped into like a utility U, you know, slash, I'll just call it U usually. It's assumed to be from time zero. Uh, so, so that's what you care about, okay, as, as a household. Uh, sometimes, yeah, it's, sometimes I'll call it a commune, okay, because it's sort of like a household. A commune is, it makes a little bit more sense than a household that's growing exponentially, I think. Um, and it's, I don't know, it sounds more fun too. So uh, representative commune. So they're, they're going to have some utility. Now we need a, a mechanism for them to kind of save and, and stuff like that. So we're going to need assets, okay? Uh, and we're going to need an asset position, okay? So that's going to be A of T, okay? So it's just like kind of how much money you have in the bank, okay? And those are going to earn a return, uh, rate of return R, okay? Which is going to be just kind of given for now. Um, and then we'll hook that into a production side later on wherein uh, you know assets actually represent stakes on capital which is which is generating a return basically okay so we'll we'll, we'll just leave it as a, a as an interest rate it's just a bank for now you don't care what's on the other side of the bank but there will be another side of the bank okay um, yeah so actually that's okay I wrote a little AFT really really we also need to be careful about aggregate versus per capita stuff okay so we're kind of gonna start in the aggregate and then move to a per capita notion. Okay, so so these these here are on the left, C and A, uh, lowercase are per capita numbers. Now with with consumption, okay, uh, you know there there is an, a notion of you know capital C is equal to little C and I'll accentuate lowercase there times L of T, right? That's that should be true, and I mean it's going to be true. This is just sort of the definitional stuff. Okay, so these are both going to be true. Um, now, with 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 assets, okay. Um, how should I say this? With assets, it's like the communes got their assets and they're all pooled together, and you, it's that's fine. Okay. Uh, with consumption, I mean, it's like you know, you 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 that utility function we drew before we wrote before has a little c because each individual values their consumption individually and then you multiply the l on the outside okay and so 
um, and we're assuming that every person is consuming is this consuming exactly the same fraction, right? So you, you let's say that the commune has this total amount of consumption, each person gets the same fraction, okay? In principle, different people in the commune could have different levels of consumption, there could be inequality within it, but that would make everything way more complicated and we wanna avoid that, which is the whole point of this representative commune business in the first place. Okay, so that, that's why we're doing it, is that if you had different levels of consumption, then people would be making different decisions based on their consumption levels or their asset levels, and it would just get very complicated. And, and that, that's more like an Iagari style model where you have different heterogeneity, okay? Here, we're, we're trying to eliminate heterogeneity, okay? So, so um, yeah, so, so that's that's an assumption, okay, but, but it's just someone to keep in mind. Um, yeah, all right, so then, and then of course, it's optimal. If, if the commune just got a certain amount of consumption, it's utilitarianly optimal uh, to equalize all of that because of the concavity of utility, all right? So it's not, it's, it, you're not losing that much, I think, um, as long as you kind of buy into this whole benevolent representative commune business, okay? Um, cool. All right. So that's, those are sort of the constructs. Basically, at, we have this asset now, which gives you a return. Okay. And the, so the question is, <clears throat> so the asset is a state now. It's like capital. Okay. And then we need to know, basically, how does that evolve? Okay. And we could just use, you know, kind of logic sort of stuff uh, to do that. Okay, so how is how is capital, or sorry, how is your asset position gonna move around? Well, um, well, I haven't told you the whole story, but it's it, it's a story that I think makes sense, which is, okay, you get some capital uh, return on uh, assets, okay, so what we would call a capital income, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and then we get some wage income, okay, so we're gonna have a wage, which might vary with T, and which is also gonna be just taken as given, okay, so it's a Walrasian you don't influence the wage, okay, when you make decisions. Um, uh, and then, uh, so so those are your two types of income, sorry, capital income, wage income. And uh, you're going to divert some of that, okay, you're going to spend some uh, on consumption. So we're going to, I'm going to write that as little, little, I mean, I could write it as capital C too. Let's, we can just write it as capital C just for whatever. Okay. Um uh, you know what? Let's 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 never let's not write capital C. Part of the problem is that they look the same. Okay, so I'm just going to always write lowercase C. Okay, it's decided. Um, so you're going to spend certain amount per person. You multiply that by L, and that's the total amount that you're spending. That's you're 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 depleting your asset position implicitly, right? If you, if you decide to, to consume something, that's stuff that you could have put in the bank, but you didn't, or you actually are taking out of the bank, depending on whether your A is positive or negative. Now remember, A is potentially negative, okay? It's, it's not gonna be, but it, it could in principle be negative. You could uh, um, owe money to people, okay? Um, but, it, but say A is positive, uh, if, you, if you draw down your savings, you know, you're gonna get a consumption, but you're gonna draw down your savings, okay? So, so that's what it's gonna look like, right? You just have capital income, wage income, consumption comes out of it, all right? <clears throat> Similar to stuff you would see in discrete time, just with the, the derivative instead, okay? Um, all right, and so that's it. And and I guess the the only th the only thing I'll say is, you know, it it, it depends on time varying stuff, but it's not like it depends. You, know, you, you the way that your assets move around today doesn't depend on the interest rate ten years from now. Your choices may, right? But like strictly speaking, how it moves around just now is just RFT and WFT. Okay, so that's that's one thing to keep in mind that that sort of temporal locality is. In our in our situation, it's good for business of, of actually being able to solve this. Okay, um, <clears throat> okay. So that's capital A. We can normalize it, right? Um, right. So now think about a little A of T. Um, and again, you know, usually when when you and let's let's not write T anymore. Okay. So let's think about every everything is assumed to be time varying. Okay, so let's think of that little a. So we, we want to normalize it. Same thing, we, we just look directly at the growth rate. Okay, um, and so that's going to be this growth rate of a minus uh, the growth rate of L. <clears throat> okay, so what's the growth rate of a? Just dividing through that first line. So first, we're going to get an R because the A capital A cancels. Second term, that wage income, right? You're going to get, I mean, you're going to get WL over A. Okay, so that doesn't so much, well, it, you know, it it has an L over A, which is one over little a, so that's good. Um, and then, 
this is going to be CL over A. Again, you can you can see it, it's going to be able to simplify in a second. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then the, that's A dot of A, and then we have a minus square root of L, which is N. Okay. So so we're almost there. Okay. So now all you say is saying, well, this is R. Let's say we have combined that minus N in there. Okay, and then we have these 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 uh, WL over A and CL over A terms. So so really, you can see this is just going to be W over A, right? So it's W over A over L. If you move that L, move the L downstairs, okay, but like with another slash. Uh, so you're going to get a W over little A minus C over little A, right? And that's it. Okay. Um, all right, so that's our, our growth rate expression, which we've now eliminated any capital variables, capitalized variables. Uh, last thing to do is just move that little a back over. So we get r minus n times a plus w minus c. And that's actually pretty simple. Okay, we don't have any capital letters, no l's, nothing. All right. Um, <clears throat> and you can see it, it kind of looks like uh, with when we had depreciation, you end up with that minus whatever the growth rate of the normalizer is uh, uh, times the variable itself. Okay, so before we had instead of minus delta, we had minus delta minus minus delta times k minus delta times sorry. Originally we had minus delta times k was our depreciation. Then we had minus delta times k minus n times k. All right, so you, it, it was a little different because um, it was depreciation was already negative and we added more negative here. You have a positive growth of, of your asset position, the interest rate, your return on assets, but then the the and population growth go in the other direction. Okay, now, yeah. So so um, that thing r minus n, in principle, it could be positive or negative. Uh, we'll kind of see because of the assumption about rho being greater than n, it'll probably end up being positive um, in the long run. Okay, so so that. Yeah, we'll, we'll kind of need that assumption, but it, it's going to work out, okay? Um, all right, so that's, that's okay. So now so, so now we kind of have everything we need in some sense, okay? I'm still uh, leaving the production side kind of amorphous, okay? Um, but it's going to be standard, all right? It's going to be the same, basically, that we assumed for solo. But if we just, you know, we don't really... At this point, we don't need to worry about production. We're we're just an we're just a representative commune out there facing a t potentially time varying path of interest rates and wages, trying to optimally choose a path of assets and consumption. Very simple game, right? Uh, and so we can just think about it like that, and then and then work on the mathematical tools for that stuff, and then bring in where do interest rates and wages come from from the production side later on. Okay. All right. So so now. Um, I, I did say I'm going to streamline this a little bit. So the, I'm going to go out of order from how I'm going in the notes um, because uh, yeah, hitting you guys with, with the next slide in the notes on slide 12, you can follow along the, if you're following along the lectures. Uh, that would be a little bit... That, that, that's, that's, this is not the right time to be slogging through algebra like that. Okay, so... Um, but essentially, if you look at the lectures, how, how the order goes there, you know, this... Thing that we have here is a differential equation. A dot equals some function of a, and it's it's non it's not homogeneous. Okay, first of all, the, you know it's it's stuff times a plus some other constants. Okay, so that w minus c part is the, the non homogeneity. It's not uh, autonomous. I think that's the word. I can't remember. I think it's non autonomous, which means that there's de explicit dependence on t. Okay. Uh, or maybe it's stationary, something like that. So there's a, the, because inside R and W, there's explicit dependence on T and also inside C, uh, things can be very complicated in principle, right? Um, but it turns out that there's a, there is a closed form expression for this for the solution to this equation, okay? Which involves you know doubly nested integrals and stuff like that. It's not pretty, but it exists, okay? So and it, it, it may potentially be useful. All right, but um, yeah. So, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through that at least yet. Okay, so we're gonna kind of skip over that. But we're, suffice to say, you can write a of t equals a bunch of stuff which involve double integrals. Okay, and that's in slide twelve. It's a linear non-autonomous differential equation, and so it's, it's like the one we had x x dot equals mx plus b. 
We, had, we did that before. We assumed m and b were constants. Now it's m of t and b of t. And you know, so here m would be m of t would be r of t minus n, b of t would be w of t minus c of t. Okay, and then a is our, our x variable. Okay, so you can it's 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 in that still in that general class of linear diffy q's, just like kind of complicated. All right, so yeah, um, yeah, so so that yeah, that that's we're we're not gonna use that until later on, but we it's just something to know. All right, so now um, we can call it, we can talk about optimization. Okay, we talk about optimization. So what's our optimization problem? I kind of spelled it out in words a second ago, but we're maximizing. Um, well, let's let's write what we're maximizing first, and then I'll say what we're maximizing over. So what we already saw what we're maximizing here is that value function from time zero, not t rho minus n, our effective discount rate, times t, uh, and u of c of t, dt. Okay, so that's our objective function. We're maximizing this over, in principle, we're actually maximizing over this whole path, which sometimes you can, you can use little brackets. I guess I should say from t equals zero to infinity. Okay, so the, the whole path, okay, now, you might think, okay, well, we're just maxing, maximizing over C, or like we're just maximizing over A, and then kind of C is implied, and like that's basically true. But we're, we're what we're the way I'm going to phrase it right now is we're maximizing over both, and there's a constraint which is linking them together. Okay, so um, you know you can always you know w w in simpler settings it's like you're eliminating a variable. It's kind of like that, but we're going to write it as a two variable sort of thing. Okay, so here, and then I'll, I guess I'll just in this one particular case, rate of t's like this. Okay, so that's the same budget equation that we just derived. Okay, so this is our this is our optimization problem. Okay, um, in its full glory. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the problem is how do you you can try to take a derivative of this, but it's not going to work out very well, right? You can, even if you put it, you know, you, you say, well, it's a constraint. I know how to do a Lagrangian, right? I can I can put a lambda on the front of that. But there's an in, there's a continuum of constraints. At every single t, this thing should be true. And it has a derivative in it, okay? So, like, how does that work um, in, the, in the sense of this a of t? Okay, so it's like that's, you know, if I move one atomic little, t, you know, a of t, you know, let's say I had a continuous... A of t, and I'm like, oh, I want to optimize this. So, oh dear, I want to optimize this. So I'm going to take this point and try and move it up here. Okay, now all of a sudden it's discontinuous. A of t doesn't even exist. A dot of t doesn't exist anymore at that point. And like, how do you even evaluate the constraints? So it's like, you can't use standard techniques. of Even if you have a Lagrangian, you can't use them because this is a complicated thing. Um, so one thing you could do is, remember I said, this constraint here is solvable in closed form. We can write AFT equals something. So now there, you might be able to make some headway because that's at AFT equals something. There's no derivative inside. There's no A dot. It's a constraint. You're still max. You're still optimizing over continuum, but you can kind of do it. All right. That 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 actually would basically work. It just it just be really unpleasant to do. Okay. Um, that's one thing. And then there's also in the slides. I also have a derivation where you kind of get rid of the a dot of t using integration by parts for a finite horizon optimization. That's instructive, I think, to see that it's sort of possible and how you get the same answer, basically. But it's not something that you're going to want to be doing on, on the reg, OK? Because there's a better way. There's like a theorem that tells you, do this, and things will be great, OK? And I'm going to give you that theorem, all right? Uh, and we're not going to, basically, it, the, the good thing about theorem is you never have to write an integral sign ever again, OK? Which is those are kind of the annoying part. I am up. Okay, so so I'm gonna in the slides I'm skipping over that example where you you do it with integration by parts. But if you want to check that out, you know I, I think it can be interesting. Okay. Um, all right. So so now we want to do this continuous time optimization. Okay. So what I'm gonna give you I'm gonna do sort of this you know kind of econ side math side dichotomy like we did with mx plus b stuff okay i'm just going to do this in x and y's 
in, in an abstract setting and then we'll come back and apply it, okay, if we have time. All right, so, um, yeah, okay, so this is like still optimization. Okay, so let's let's uh, change the notation. So, so I'm gonna define an optimization problem, okay, which is the max. Okay, so we're gonna use x and y, so x of t and y of t, maximizing that. Um, how did I? Yeah, um, for this type of uh, objective function. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna still use rho as our as our discounting rate. So so this is not completely 100% general, you know, uh, this objective function because it's still separable over time. It's saying you have a function that that's just comes from x and y at a given time. You you look at the you know, constant rate discounting of that. Okay. Um, you know, rho could in principle depend on t. Some of this stuff isn't strictly necessary. The separability kind of is okay over time, but but some of the stuff you can kind of fiddle with and it, and it won't it won't be too bad. Okay, so this this is okay. So this is like our problem that we're solving. Okay, maximizing that, and then our constraint in in the abstract is going to be x dot of t is equal to g. So here I'm going to write in explicitly that you can have you can have explicit time dependence. Okay. So g of t and x and y. Okay, so let's, I guess we should say, what are these x and y's? Okay, so x is our state variable. x is like assets, okay? x is moving around over time. It's, you know, has a persistence to it. Um, and it's influenced by, how it changes is influenced by both its current level, x of t, and our control variable, y of t. Okay, so y of t is like consumption. Okay, y, y of t is the thing we're kind of moving around you know, it's, they say control variable because it's like optimal control. It's, I don't know, like a steering wheel, the angle of your steering wheel, uh, how hard you're pushing on the accelerator, etc. That's that's sort of when this stuff was developed. For um, a lot of this stuff was developed, I think, for probably war fighting and things like that. So you're in a plane and you you want to, or a missile, let's say, or a spacecraft, you want to optimally get to some point, right? So so that's sort of the the progeny here. Um, but so, so y is your control variable and that influences how x evolves over time, okay? And you wanna do that optimally, okay? Uh, there's, there's also some other, what I would call technical. Okay, so, so first of all, your initial condition, that's obviously necessary. You need to know where you're starting because x is a persistent state variable. You need to know where you start, okay? Um, and, another and, uh, we need this assumption Okay, that basically there's some bound on x. Okay, um, yeah, I don't even know. I mean, it's it's a little weird because it's sort of like you're optimizing over x. Okay, but you 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 need some ability to bound the evolution of x. So actually, where did I forgot where B of T comes from. I need to think about that. It's not really that important. It's really just some technical thing. I wouldn't worry about it. Okay, so um, let's see actually. So that's our that's the statement of our problem. Okay, uh, and we want to solve this. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, it's kind of like Lagrangian except more. Okay, so it's, it's like the Lagrangian of continuous time optimization. Okay, uh, so it's essentially, how to incorporate a time varying constraint on a state variable. Okay, so what we're going to do is, and so this is called Hamiltonian optimization. And we're going to write down a function which is called the Hamiltonian and labeled h. Okay, so t, x, y, let's. So this is a function. Okay, this, um, it's a function of t of your time t of your state variable x, of your control variable y, and lambda, which is like your Lagrange multiplier kind of thing. Okay, or your, we can just call it your multiplier. Okay, so so um, it's not a function, like it's not a function of paths, all right? It's just maps from these four things into a number, okay? Uh, and and it's, 
and we're just defining it, okay? We're just saying this is, that we're asserting this is a new function that we're defining, okay? It's gonna look like this, okay, plus lambda. So, and it's it's kind of like, uh, um, you know, it is an analogous to a, a Lagrangian, okay? So we're using lambda, which is a common way to write the Lagrangian, okay? There's the objective, okay, but we, we just have um, the objective, let's see. All right, yeah. So we just have this, so I, might, I have to like point it a different window. So we just have this objective here at that time, okay? So we don't have the whole integral, we just have at that time, the objective, and then the here we don't have x dot of t, right? You know, the, the, the derivative part, we just have how it's moving. Okay, so it's kind of Lagrangian, but it's adapted, okay? And so we're just defining this, and we're and just like with the Lagrangian, you just define the Lagrangian. So this is a new function, and we're gonna look at certain like derivatives of this, of this function, and those are gonna characterize the solution, okay? Same thing here, we're asserting this Hamiltonian as a function, we're free to define it however we want, and we're gonna define it like this. We're gonna look at certain derivatives of this as conditions that are gonna guarantee optimality, okay? So that's the theorem is that, as long as you satisfy these conditions, it's optimal. And the way to find the optimal path then is to just look at these conditions, okay? And hopefully things turn out nicely, all right? Um, okay, now, there's one kind of annoying thing is that exponential. Uh, you'd think there'd be a way to not have it because we kind of know it's there, why not get rid of it, right? Um, and it's the only place that um, there's like, well, there, there's explicit independence on t from, from g, but it's annoying, basically. Okay, so we're going to define a version without it. And it turns out you can you can work with the version without it, and I'm all, we're almost always going to work on this version without it. And just to be extra confusing, because we're always going to work with this version without the exponential, I'm going to drop the hat at some point. And also I'm changing this to mu, okay, because it's just how, it's how we do it. All right, so this is like a present, so this is, the first one was called the uh, current value, uh, sorry, the present value Hamiltonian. This one is called the current value Hamiltonian, which sounds the same, but if you think about, no, maybe it's the opposite, but it, it, it's, a, it's an allusion to net present value, right? So you're looking at this, are you looking at net present value or just like the actual realized value at that time? It's a question of, are you thinking about it per the perspective of time t or time zero? Okay, here we're, in the first one, we're thinking about it from the perspective of time zero and we're discounting. Here we're thinking about it like as we move, we also move our perspective, which is easier. Okay, so here we just have that inner objective function, which is usually just gonna be the utility, U of C, uh, and then this same term, except we've re renamed this mu because we don't wanna get confused. All right, so that's, that's, our, that's our, this is the real thing that we're gonna be using from now on all the time. All right, and we'll probably drop the hat. In fact, I'm gonna drop the hat basically in the next slide. Okay, so, um, all right, so we're almost out of time. So I need to like, I need to get some deliverables for you guys. All right, so I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna skip over kind of like the technical conditions a little bit and just say like, let's say we just wanted to like casually solve this, all right? And essentially <clears throat> you're gonna get uh, two conditions, okay? Uh, and and they're, they kind of make sense in a way. Okay, so the first thing is you 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 have this control variable y. Okay, that that one is pretty simple. So so um, optimality conditions. Okay, so you have this control variable y. All right, so let's just rewrite the Hamiltonian is f of x y plus mu g t x y. Okay, and I guess I should say this is a function of t, x, y, mu. Okay, so it's a function, just a function of t, x, y, mu. It's, it's not a function of paths, remember that. Um, okay, so, so then the conditions are, number one, uh, h, y of t, x of t, y of t, mu of t, should be equal to zero. This is like a first order condition. You have your um, uh, you have your control variable. You move it around such that the derivative equals zero. Okay. Now there's questions of sufficiency, necessity, and all that. But 
Assume it's sort of concave, then this is just like a first order condition. Take a derivative, set it to zero. That's your control variable. Now the thing is, because of the way this function is set up, um, it's accounting not just for the effect on f, but also sort of like through the multiplier, how it affects everything else going forward. So that's the, the sort of the magic of how you incorporate this. Like if I change y today, that changes x today, but also not today, but in the future, and there's a whole path. Everything is incorporated into mu basically, okay? Um, and then the other thing, which is a little bit less intuitive, uh, is saying that this thing, okay, and I, I, I'm writing of t here because you're, <clears throat> like, remember I said that h is not a function of t, but if you put in x of t, of, of the paths, it's not a function of paths, but you can apply it at a, a point on the path, right? So this should be true at all t on an optimal path. Okay, so, yeah. Um, and then we can also write the second thing, where I'm gonna write of t as well. And here, <clears throat> we're going to look at h sub x. So the first one, we looked at h sub y, which is just optimally choosing your control variable. Here, we're looking at h sub x, the derivative with respect to x. Again, Is your value. writing yep. possibly yep. paused? That's, is this, is it going? There it is, yeah. Yeah, there it's was like, a, I probably, yeah, it's like built up a lag or something. Oh, it was okay, more so, lag, okay. Yeah, no, no, but the lag is like variable too, I think. So it's like, we should... We could analyze it uh, if you guys want to analyze the lag. I guess you can't analyze the lag. I, you need more information, but I don't know what the process is. There's some lag process. Um, so the yeah. So this is the second equation. This one's uh, less intuitive, okay? Um, especially as it's written now. Um, but it's basically because mu encodes all the information about like if I change y today, what's all, what's going to happen in the future? How is it going to change my state, and how is that going to change f? through x in the future. And especially like if x changes, I might change how I choose y in the future. So this is very complicated whole future path considerations, which are all incorporated to mu, but we need to make sure that mu actually incorporates that stuff, okay? So <clears throat> so then what this, what mu is doing is is sort of tracking, if I change if I change x today, that's gonna change x in the future for a whole path. So mu is tracking how does changing x change my uh, objective, okay? And so we're, we're writing like this. Next time, I'm out of time, but next time I can show you that it, this equation, you can kind of like invert it. So this is the differential form. You can write it in integral form and it'll look like it's sort of tracking what happens when I change X a little bit today. How does that influence the whole future path of sort of returns, okay? So mu, the, the trick is make sure that mu is satisfied, is constructed in such a way that it encodes how does everything change in the future? And then you choose y, taking mu into account. Okay, so that's how it all sort of comes together, is that, that make sure mu is tracking stuff in the future, choose y according to mu and also f of x. Okay, uh, f of x, y. And that, yeah, so that's all very abstract. When we apply it to Ramsey, it'll actually give us a really rather simple solution. Okay, eventually. Okay, so so this is pretty abstract, but it's it's quite powerful. I mean, you can, you can write down any old equation, you can write down Ramsey, you can write down Ramsey plus other stuff. You could write down various, you know, and we'll do it, uh, different types of continuous time optimization problems. Just take two derivatives. You get two differential equations um, characterizing, well, you get three. You'll get these two things, and then you'll also get sort of the the, uh, the equation that you assumed in the first place, how x dot evolves, right? So then you'll, uh, which is g of t. So that this is just what you assumed, right? This is assumed. In the first place, these two are, are sort of from the theorem. Uh, okay, you can't see it yet. It'll come there eventually. But essentially, you assume that that process for x, okay, that's your third equation. And you, if you think about x, y, and u are sort of your unknowns, okay? You need three equations to characterize that. Right now, you can see two. The lag process is getting pretty out of control. Uh, but there's the third one is the, the law of motion for x, okay? And, and with all of those, then you can, in principle, you can solve the equation. Okay, there, finally, it's showing up. Um, okay, so three, equa you know, three equations, three paths. In principle, maybe you can solve it, and it turns out that you, you often can, all right? And you can in the case of Ramsey. All right, so that's that's pretty much it. I'm out of time. Um, we'll, 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 we'll talk about some of the more nuanced technical assumptions that you need for this. Uh, there's some sort of limiting behavior you need to, to worry about, preventing Ponzi schemes and such. Uh, so we'll talk about that too next time and how to apply it to Ramsey, okay?
and I'll yes, yeah, so and then I'll try to get your homework back real soon, and I'll post the solutions today as well too. All right. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'll stick around for a minute or two if you have any questions. Otherwise, I'll see you all on, on Thursday.